happy Saturday. Uh, this is Jennifer Steck. I'm the communications coordinator with the Park Hill Art Club. And this is actually interview number seven. So we've been doing this for seven weeks now and we're thrilled to have Steve Griggs and his lovely partner Sue with us to talk about Steve's process. And if anybody has any questions, as I said, go ahead and put them in the chat room. We'll go ahead and get started if that's okay with you guys. Awesome. Okay, so Steve, tell us about yourself. Okay, um, well, I've been painting for a long, long time. Uh, Cliff Notes version, I, I know it's Cliff Austin's there. I had, or, uh, I had to use your name, Cliff. When I was uh, probably nine, 10 or so, um, I was out shopping with my mom. And I've always been interested in drawing and painting from a little kid and we were out shopping and we, we weren't super affluent, but. Uh, I, I found this watercolor set that had two paints in it, which was much different than the cake sets and everything. And I was looking at it one day in the store. She saw me looking at it. And she asked me if I if I wanted it, but it was I don't know. It was pretty. It was wasn't inexpensive. And she bought that set for me that day. That was a big deal. That uh, that little thing that she did though honored that um, part of my spirit that. Um, that, that I've been nurturing and growing for 64 years now. And uh, I think that was really like the impetus for my love of watercolor. Because I would paint in, uh, in the basement and, and, uh, and have painted all my life, but really seriously started painting in watercolor. I, I have a degree in art, it was in design. My degree's in studio art, but I did most of my, uh, my work as a career in the design field. But, uh, but I've always had a love of watercolor and painting. And that really took off about uh, 15, 20 years ago, started showing in shows around the Denver metro area. Now we're showing internationally and nationally. Um, and uh, we've had a, a, just a wonderful success. Uh, two years ago, the reason why we're both here is that we formed a joint. Um, we've always wanted to do uh, an art business uh, to really, uh, get that honored and going. Sue is a great writer and I'm a painter. And, um, and we said, well, what, why don't we just, why don't we do this? So we formed Peace Love Art LLC. And that's who you're in, the, you're in the world headquarters of <laughs> Peace Love Art LLC right now. Uh, welcome to our company. We, uh, we are a pet friendly company. So there may be cats and dogs wandering through as we can do this. But um, <clears throat> for about the last two years, we have been really um, moving Peace Love Art, and Sue's been doing, uh, she'll tell you about that, I'll turn it over to her. She's been doing most of the marketing and communications piece, so when you see our newsletters and when you see uh, our website and all that, that's Sue's writing and our ideas, but Sue's writing, she's just wonderful. She's done a great job of promoting us. <clears throat> we are in a number of galleries now, and we've been published in Watercolor Artist Magazine, the Artist Magazine in England, Southwest Art has written up on us, and all that is Sue's craft and handiwork. And I'll turn it over to her for a minute to let her tell you a little bit about Peace Love Art and what we do, and then we'll talk about the mechanics of a painting. I will get into that. And I'll take you over to my table, and I've got it set up with sketchbooks and paintings, and we can talk about all the nerdy art stuff <clears throat> after we talk about the business thing. Side. Well, I don't know that there's a whole lot to say. Uh, we do have a website, as Steve said. Um, you can find it at uh, stevegriggswatercolor.com. You can find us on Facebook. Uh, everything is under Watercolor Art of Steve Griggs, so Facebook and Instagram, and we're on LinkedIn. I don't do a huge amount with that. Um, but anyway, you can find us on uh, Pinterest, so all the, most of the social media sites, the main ones. Um, under watercolor art of Steve Griggs. And what else did you want me to say? Please go read that. Be read all the pages because she's done a, such, it's been recognized by, um, uh, help me with that. It was Artsy Shark, yeah. Artsy Shark is one of the best uh, uh, watercolor or, or artist promotion sites. Uh, go go uh, look at that link and watch that show. It's really good. But Sue's done such a good job. Just can't say how, how much, uh, I can't say enough about that. Mm -hmm. So that's why I wanted that to get in. Today too. We also do a newsletter. If you're interested, you can sign up for the newsletter at the website, and I do that once a month, just kind of, mostly it's chitty chat stuff, but 
tells you a little bit about what we're doing in the art world as well. So, yeah. I think we all need a Sue. <laughs> yes, you do. Well, you know, I, I, I think that, to be honest, <laughs> I think that for most artists, that is really important. You know, what the way that we started this business, we talked a long time, like we talked for years, years. and years about Steve being a full-time artist. When we were in college. Yeah, when we were yeah. in college. Which we you can tell was a long time ago. A long time ago. Yeah. So before we were married, because um, our 40th wedding anniversary is this August, but we've been married a long time. And even before that, we started talking about Steve being a full-time artist. Yeah. But we, we couldn't quite figure out how to make that happen. and. Even up until about three years ago, we were saying, oh, well, what we'll do is Steve will just do full-time art and I'll be the breadwinner. So we, we thought that was seemed like a great idea. But then we started thinking about it and it was sort of like, no, that's not gonna work because we will have stacks and stacks and stacks of paintings, which we already do anyway, but we would have stacks and stacks of paintings in this house and nobody would ever see it or know about it because Steve isn't about promoting it, he's just about doing it. And so it kind of clicked that, huh, this is really a two person deal and somebody's gotta be the front man or front woman out there really promoting and letting people know about Steve and his work. And so that really is my function. I love it, it's fun, I believe in his work, I love his work and I do love to write. And so uh, it makes a nice team actually. Yeah, we have a great team. Oh, that sounds great. Steve, you, you touched on this just a little bit already about how you got into watercolor, but what is it you love about that medium? Oh my gosh. Um, we don't have, what, 40 minutes? Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah. we, may, we may add another 10 minutes on the end. All of right, <laughs> okay, beauty. There's so much. Well, I paint in acrylics and oils and have painted in, in acrylics, but, there, but watercolor is such a... Uh, an immediate, emotionally connecting medium. I don't find that same uh, connection with acrylics or oils, uh, pastels. It's, uh, I've worked those mediums a lot, um, a lot more. Um, I know that there are some gifted artists uh, on this that I can't see, but I know a couple I can see that are just gifted at putting down oil and and they have a real love and affinity for that process. The, uh, it's more of an additive kind of thing, but watercolor is, well, uh, the best way I've heard it said is, uh, oils and acrylics is like training a dog and watercolor is like trying to train a cat. <laughs> so, and I think that's uh, an awesome way to express it. You, you know, watercolor can provide this emotional expression that no other, no other medium. I don't care if you're watering down acrylics. Watercolor has that connection that nothing else does. Maybe inks. Um, it's the fluidity, the immediacy, the the uh, the way colors combine on the page, the the uh, different intensities of colors you can get. You know, we can get into a big argument about that. But I'm really drawn to the way watercolor presents, and the way that uh, working with watercolor um, is this iterative. I'm going to use that word maybe too much today, but it's iterative, it's developmental, it's, uh, it happens in front of you, it happens beside you, and then sometimes it happens on top of you, you know, and, and that's why paper's cheap, because you can just get another sheet of paper and when it happens on top of you, and it does, but I'm just connected, have always been, uh, to the emotional expressibility of this medium, yeah, so. It's it's intimidating to me. I, I paint in acrylics and, and watercolor is less forgiving and I usually need all the help I can get. <laughs> so um, Joan has a question and this might lead nicely into um, the process question, but um, how did you develop your very abstract way of painting uh -huh. and what was your incentive to go in that direction? Okay, so my, my training was in design. It, to be specific, it was in industrial design, consumer product design, where, and of course we did in college, that was a long, long time ago, we did very um, uh, art-oriented, I had an art-oriented education, color theory, blah, 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 but design is about um, specific communication, and so I always kicked against the goads in my design training because I would do renderings and they would be tight, but they would still have this flair or this, it would walk off center a little bit. And um, it was always a frustrating moment to me. And I think the reason for that was because I was, I am an artist in designer's clothes at that point in my life. 
in uh, right around the year 2000, uh, 1999, 2000, somewhere in there, I forget the actual, actual year, I got laid off and, and I went into this depression. Now, this isn't like no violins and cellos playing now. This isn't a sad moment. This was the best thing that could ever have happened to me. But in that moment, I started painting to, to work my, as a, as a thing to do to, it was ther therapy. therapy, actually. And what I found was that I began to paint and express myself completely differently than I did when I was working as the designer. What the, the, the flipping point was, was that as I painted, I, be, I, I came to a realization that I had an artist's heart and an artist's temperament, and I began to call myself an artist. At that point, the world really did change for me. The, express, the expression of my art changed. And I think it has a lot to do with identity. I think that um, you asked me for what kind of advice would you give uh, beginning artists? I would say, come to grips with the fact that if you have an interest in, and you have these juices inside of you, this need to express, there's a high probability, I'm gonna say 100%, that you're an artist. So call yourself an artist, take on that identity. When I did that, I began to, it's just a strange thing, um, but I began to give myself permission. Uh, and, and this is sounding very transactional, but I began to give myself permission to experiment and to be free. And, and, and that whole capturing the identity and, and, uh, and giving myself that identity was the place where I can go back and look at work and see it. I can see where I began to be very free. And so my brushwork changed, my brushwork changed the, the need to express things exactly uh, drifted away to the, and, and I became more connected with, during that period of time, with my emotional center, and which I think artists, uh, writers, poets, musicians, uh, we do have that uh, gift, really. It's the way we're wired, you know, I don't like that. It's a, that's mechanical, but we are, we are formulated that way. When we connect with that, that's when we find how do I express? How, what medium should I work in? What do I want to say? Um, and it goes back to uh, that identity thing. That's when it started. And, um, and I can look back at work and it's really tight in the early 90s. And then it just starts to get looser and more expressive as I get more comfortable with that place and uh, comfortable with showing. Showing was a big hurdle for me. I'm very much an introvert right now. I'm operating on about 98% blood level um, adrenaline. So mm -hmm. I've got to kind of kind of dial myself back a little bit. It happens in the classroom too. So if you take a workshop or class from me, I'm jumping around a lot. But, but the more connected I got, uh, the, the more um, expressive things came out of that. And I know there are many artists listening to this going, yeah, I know what he's talking about. There are some who may be hearing that and going, oh, that's what I'm wrestling with. So I would just encourage them to connect with that. Um, so there was that. There was that transition moment, that epiphany moment where I called, began to identify as an artist. I began to use that language with people. What do you do, Steve? Well, I'm an artist. And oh, it's very interesting. And then we would talk about it. And the more I, li I started living into that, the work began to really change. I began, I was changing. Um, I think what was happening is I was just really exploding outward. And so that was a big part of, part of it. And I think uh, that's what I hear people say they see in my work. Um, I'm more about what am I feeling from that scene? What am I trying to capture from that scene? And what am I trying to express with, from that, in that scene, like if I'm out plein air painting, rather than the uh, actual mechanics of, visual mechanics of what I see in front of me. I do try to capture that, but if I don't have a connection with the scene, um, I, I generally don't paint it, but if it's like an aha kind of thing, I'm going by and it's like, oh my gosh, I gotta paint that. That's, that's where that happens, so. Uh, so maybe this would be a good time to, now did, can you ask, a, did that answer that person's question? I believe so, but I'll, let me ask it to you again, just in case you wanna add anything else. Um, how did you develop your very abstract way of painting and what was the incentive to go in that direction? So I think okay. you pretty much caught it. Okay. And then I, I, I would like to, I'm gonna go over, we have two devices set up. So I'm gonna enable my phone 
and the audio over on my phone. We're gonna disconnect the, the video and audio here for just for a few minutes. Then we'll come back here and finish up here. But I'll be working over that table. I wanna show you my sketchbooks because that's a huge part of the answer too. When I began to work in my sketchbooks, I began to see uh, ideas. Well, let's go over and, and do that, okay. Okay, we got you, Steve. Awesome, okay. So, so a big part of that transition period was I started working in my sketchbooks. And I, um, I've always been the kind of person who carried uh, art materials with me everywhere I went. You know, when we used to go on vacation, I would have to pack up a, um, a, you know, a backpack or something with art materials. But in art school, we were taught, you know, in design school especially, we, we had to work in sketchbooks. But, but it was different. Um, it was more about meeting the check on the box because we would have to have, I remember when I was at Art Center, each week we'd have to come in with 10 or 20 pages of sketchbook work done and it was, uh, on top of everything else, it was arduous. So I never really appreciated that through college and through Art Center. But when I started, um, when I started working as an artist, um, I began to use my sketchbook as a place to develop ideas, thoughts. I work from motifs um, a lot, so I might do a sketch like this, and I hope you can see all that. I think I can zoom in a little. And this might be based on, uh, you know, like Breckenridge. I might pull off the road and do a sketch like this, and then if I find something, um, that I call a motif. And then, uh, and I work in bound sketchbooks. I also, but I have found these um, spiral bound ones and I haven't worked in spiral bound for a long time because they're perforated and you can tear the pages out and that's too tempting for me when something doesn't work. But I think that the sketchbooks are the places where you give yourself permission to explore, to, to develop ideas. And, and as you develop ideas, you'll start to see some motifs emerge. And when those motifs begin to emerge, there's an idea there that needs to be developed. And I think that might be the, the last of it. So I will develop several pages of these kinds of ideas. And of course, you know, I'm known for cityscapes and, uh, so, and my landscapes, and I have examples of that. But I will take these, um, these kinds of sketches. I'm going to back out the camera just a little bit now. Back it out, there we go. And then I, from, from the sketchbook, then I'll start to develop, I'll start to develop some sketches like this and uh, working on different types of paper or different types of, um, using different color schemes. I'll work out color schemes and you can see the motif changing through this, this process. It's very iterative and I get these, I get, really good ideas this way. So this is a big part of, of how I paint. And I hope I'm not going too fast. If I am, somebody please say something. And you can see there's a whole host of uh, avenues that I can depart from uh, by taking a motif and then um, developing it and pushing it and pulling it. And I think that's a, a pretty good uh, example of how that works. And I'll do that. So in this case, I was working on a, um, at Murata Gallery up in Indian Hills, there's a show called uh, Night and Day. And I was working on uh, some concepts for how to express night and day. And, and these ideas um, began to uh, crystallize around that kind of thinking. Uh, and then I developed them into two canvas paintings I did, watercolor on canvas, that I then um, uh, lacquered with a, uh, uh, UV protecting lacquer and they're up in the they're like uh, what are they like 15 by 30 or 20 by 30 something like that um, up as part of the show but that was what I was developing those idea those ideas for and those motifs and so my sketchbooks are full of sometimes color studies and I think yeah you can see that sometimes I'm working with uh, um, some different wash techniques um, I might be out just sketching people and, you know, and uh, writing notes to myself. Anyway, I can't st stress enough the, um, 
the idea of, of working in a sketchbook and, and I do meet a lot of artists for whom they don't work in sketchbooks. But I, I think when I began to, to work in sketchbook and I probably have 30 or 40 of them sitting right here on, in, the, in the world headquarters of Love, Peace, Art or Love Art, what are we? Love Peace, art. Love, Art. <laughs> and I can go back to them and I can, sometimes I can go back and I can actually relive the feelings I was experiencing the day when I did the sketch. And then I can take that and of course make, uh, make paintings out of them. But I'll work across uh, the gutter and, and all that kind of thing. I have found, I found this Excel watercolor Canson Excel book to be the best for me. I work in this five by eight format. This is really good to take out in the field. Uh, I also work in the nine by 12 on the same, same material. I don't like their multimedia, but this has um, more forgiveness uh, in the page. And a lot of times I will tape the page with uh, magic mending tape. I'm just going to play for you and then I can I can do a quick uh, sketch and I can, and I can do multi cells okay hold up we're frozen oh I can see is it good for everybody else but I, I can generate you know uh, quick quick sketches in this fashion and then I remove the tape and and they have a, a more clean, uh, uh, clean appeal to them, clean appeal, um, like that. So I can generate some ideas very quickly, and this paper um, lets lets me use the tape, so it it won't rip. And I've also purchased the same kind of book from Art Artiza and um, I've been working it in it recently and uh, I find that this paper uh, the the tooth will tear up so it's so I'm still learning how to work with that so Steve can I interrupt you for just a second of course yeah question um, from Janice what is magic mending tape it is um, it's scotch tape but it's it's uh, comes in a green plaid box and it's different from their standard, um, I think it has less tooth on the, on the tape, less glue. So it's, it's, it's used uh, to, be, to be repositionable and it doesn't leave uh, residue. And, and I like the magic, I, I call it magic mending. I think it's called uh, Scotch magic tape or something. Um, I think in the old days, a few years ago, it was called magic mending and then they changed the name. But again, it's the it's all about the the flexibility of the tape, yeah. and I don't use off brands. I have tried to use cheaper, and what it does is it ends up tearing the tooth of the page. Like I don't know if you can see that, but it's it when you lift it up, if it's not the right paper or if it's not um, uh, magic tape, this was a, an off brand tape because I was trying it out. Um, it will it'll tear the page and sometimes it'll tear into your work and you don't want that so but anyway I use this kind of technique a lot in my studio to get to generating uh, ideas in the morning um, or I will go out in the field and I will I'll do a, a sketch a series of sketches and you can see I can I can work very quickly uh, with this process and using these kinds of books I can get uh, a really nice log. Oh, there's some more of those motifs. Here's the book I was looking for. <laughs> Look at that. So I was developing all of these. I don't know how many more of these? Okay, so here's another one. Push this away. I just want to. Uh, I just want to show you how um, how the. This is a big part of the process of how I work. And when I have a theme, I'll keep running down that theme exploring different formats and different ways of different color sets, different color schemes, um, same motif. But you can see I can get a lot of different ideas and feelings uh, for the same subject matter. Here I'm working on a, a cityscape. And he here is more development work that I did on the, um, for the night and day show. Uh, there's, there's a more developed piece for the night and day show and I think I'm 
moving into other things. There's back to that motif. I'll work on grayscales. I'll, I'll do these kind of things all over the place, you know. But I can generate that stuff very quickly. From the sketchbook, I'll start, let me get to a white page, like right here. Again, I, I can talk for hours, um, and I don't want to do that to, to any of you people, but I will then generate, um, I'll take it to paper, then I'll generate sketches. Uh, here I'm working on some Michigan Harbor work. I work uh, with a lot of Midwest themes, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota. Uh, I like harbors, and I'll work with, um, I'll work up these kind of things, and then I'll take them, once I feel comfortable with the idea, I'll take them up to, uh, I don't know what this was generated. These are farm scenes, I think. But I work, and here's some more. I ruined this one, but I'll, but I'll show it to you because I'm not ashamed. Um, and I'll also do uh, color swatches uh, as I'm thinking about, well, I want these two colors. What, what other color mixes can I get um, from those two? And then these are some sketches I did of Fishtown. Um, on, uh, you know, uh, this is from a photograph, but I, but I've done this kind of work in my sketchbook and on pages when, when I'm out in the field looking for an idea. Fishtown is in Michigan. Fishtown is in Michigan, yeah. Steve, how do you yeah. do the white areas? What's that? Uh, the question from Mary is, how do you do the white areas? The white areas like uh, this here? Um, I'm guessing that's probably correct. Okay, there's a couple of ways I do that. So, so I might just, uh, this is on watercolor paper. I might leave the paper white. I might, uh, as I'm washing down, I might leave these little jewels of white in my washes. Um, and then oftentimes too, if I'm doing a cityscape, I'm not, a sh I will use uh, white gouache or white, I like, um, Graham has a, a white it's called titanium white opaque i use this quite a bit it's a it's a thinner and it will mix down whereas uh, uh, gouache will kind of stay up on top but i use this uh, gram i like gram i'll talk about material in just a second but i'll put highlights back into the painting after i've accomplished the painting i'll i'll either leave them in or sometimes i scrape them in i'm looking for a a scrape in right now here's some so here I've left this white area white and painted positive and negative shapes. Again, I've left those little white jewels in the washes as I was doing them. And uh, this, this particular one does not have any white added, you know, like uh, highlights. So these are all whites that I left in the painting process. So I do both. Sometimes I will paint around and or leave jewels of white in my work or I will put highlights back into the work. I don't think this has any, this doesn't have any white in it at all. Oh, but one more way I get married, one more way I get white is by scraping in with a knife. Or I have a, if you take a class or a workshop from me, I give you, this one's been used a lot, but I give you a patent pending Steve Griggs watercolor. It's not patent pending, but it, it's a Steve Griggs watercolor knife to each of my students. And to get these trees, I'll scrape back. Sometimes I'll scrape back highlights. I don't think I see any. There's a, there's a couple of, uh, there's a scrape in right there. Um, that's scrape in here. And sometimes depending on the wetness of the paper, uh, technique wise, you can get um, a grayer scrape than this would, than, you, know, you can take it back to the, the white of the paper. Or I will, I will lift out. So here's, here's a couple more sketches. And so you can see the uh, highlights are pretty predominant there. Anyway, um, so that's how I, I work with sketches in my sketchbook and then I build up into this process and I might do, these are all iterative paintings from the same city scene. So you can see that I'll take that same idea and uh, uh, like, a, like think of a Cherry Creek, uh, corner and uh, in Cherry Creek and I will do different iterations based on that same corner and try to find like I really like the light and dark that's happening in this sketch here 
this could make a, a very nice painting um, later. And then, uh, and then paper, of course, always has, uh, this is a different kind of paper. This is more of like a 80 pound, this is a 140 pound. Paper will always uh, influence the look. It, it'll shift the look somewhat. I wanted to show you my dog park and I can't find my dog park. <laughs> okay, well, I'll give you a little anyway. time to find that because I would like to see that. Um, so from Mariposa is how do you <clears throat> approach a composition for a particular focal point? Mm -hmm. You want me to look for the dog park on here? Is it the new blue one that you did? Yeah, here it is. Oh, okay. That's it right there. That's a great question. So when I teach, I do teach um, mechanics like shape development and composition. Is it an L shape or a, a, a V shape composition? I do teach about or talk about mechanics of painting. I think the, the best demonstration is probably this to answer that question. So when, but so, so I try to be aware of the, the use of value. And, and again, we could spend five weeks talking about value and shape and color um, and the development of all those things. But, uh, so, I, so I do talk about those things, but when I think about doing a sketch or a painting, I will try to ask myself, what is it, what is it that I'm trying to say? To me, art is about giving an answer. My big definition of art is art is giving an answer back to creation. Creation is, makes the statement to us artists first, we, we wouldn't paint or draw anything that we don't experience. So uh, our art is always a response to what creation is saying to us. So the questions that arise for me is out of that definition, what is it I'm trying to say here? What is my unique point of view on the subject? And what am I trying to say? Now, a lot of people use words like center of interest and, and all kind of, kind of stuff. And that is, is, what's the big idea? And what I try to do is I will try to create an interesting painting that's got visual movement through the painting, but I will try to um, put my color or my lights and my darks, and this is a very traditional approach to that kind of thing, where I want the eye to go initially. But I want you to, as an artist, I want the viewer to have a viewing experience, a, a journey. So I will try to give you darks and lights around that that are more value statements than color statements. And, but there'll be interesting uses or juxtapositions of value. So I'll have dark values against lighter values, whites against, you know, uh, highlights against, um, uh, mid-tones and that kind of thing, but my mid-tones and my darks are generally in the, the boundary areas. Um, like for example here, this is probably the lightest area. I've got most more lights here. I've got them scattered around. I do have quite a bit up here, but I've got a, a pretty nice visual flow right here in, in the sketch. I would change this for a paint, things that for, about this in the painting. I like what's going on here. I like this interaction here. That's developing the, what's the statement about? And the statement is about a boat yard where men, men and women work. It can be about, um, it can be about scale. So then I will try to, I will try to put my subject against something uh, that really, um, helps that statement. So in this case, I was driving east of here out on the plains uh, from where I live and there are all these eucalyptus, I think they're eucalyptus, they might be a different kind of tree, but they're growing up in the river, the river swales out there. And I really liked this idea. Well, I thought that the best way I could um, state that idea was to put the dark tree mass against the light sky and then I put some texture in the foreground to make it interesting, but I want your eye to go here first. And then after I've got you there, then I want you to wander around the, the, the visual, the painting, and have fun. 
this was a square format. I don't often paint in square, square formats, but usually I will paint in uh, the traditional landscape or uh, uh, landscape or portrait formats. But I really love elongated landscapes and elongated portraits as well. And I use all of those devices to help tell my story or create my center of interest. That's what I do. They're beautiful, Steve. Um, okay, question from Joan. How realistic are the colors in your paintings and you, do you usually take artistic license? I almost always take artistic license. Um, I don't really have this need anymore to, again, when I make these statements, these are personal statements. These are not statements to be um, superimposed on anybody else. But if I'm in a, if I'm in a, uh, if I'm at Cherry Creek State Park and I have, oh, thank you. Uh, this is from an article we did for Artist Magazine where I talk specifically about unwrapping unique colors in landscapes. I, I think I'll use this as an, as an example, but um, was it Joan that asked that question? Yes. Joan, um, I, if I'm at Cherry Creek State Park and it's high summer and we've got lots of browns and greens and all that, a lot of times I, I might sketch the native color, but th it's, it's uh, fleeting. <laughs> I will generally go to, um, this one's all dried out, but I'll go to different areas of my, um, my pan, my watercolor, my, my paint box. I'll go to different areas of my paint box and develop a color scheme like I was starting to show you in my in my swatches where I, I'll say well what would sienna and um, what would sienna and cerulean what could I get out of that in this scene and how can I use those colors to to tell the story better it's a lot of times if you use a non-native color um, it takes it out of the realism realm but it allows you to do things like create the feeling of a tree line instead of be uh, worried about capturing the exactness of that tree line. And oftentimes that will help it feel more real. It's a weird juxtaposition, but here I'm using um, opera pink against, I think this is, uh, I don't recall, it might be a phthalo turquoise. Um, and then there's an earth tone down here. Maybe it's a sienna or a quinacridon, something. I can't remember what colors I use. I could go look it up. I say thalo turquoise burn umber. <laughs> I'm so weird. I actually say it right down here. Okay. So anyway, but but look at the uh, look at the dynamic feel you get from what would might be interpreted as an ordinary little scene by changing up the colors. And I'm more intrigued by those kinds of exercises and uh and i do these i, I call these um gifts from the moment in my classes i'll do i'll have people uh all my students uh, quad off a piece of paper and just throw down some marks and um and then to help them uh get freer with their brush strokes because a lot of people are trying to be very exacting and and we'll do this thing called gifts from the moment and I will get these, these truly wonderful gifts from the moment. And I'll get these beautiful paintings that are, you know, the motif, like I was talking about earlier. I'll get these motifs early and often that I can then push and pull and get a great painting from. My answer is I hardly ever, like my cityscapes, I might have a gray, I might gray out my buildings a lot. So in my world, this purple is a gray. So I might gray out my buildings and I might put my color, uh, this is not a great example, but, um, and then I'll put my color, here I'm working with browns that are grays. You know, I use them as a gray, and then I'll have a highlight of, of color and, and whites in the thing. But you, this is Traverse City, Michigan, um, is the source for this. This is not what this street, look, you won't see this scene. And yet, when I hang this in a gallery in Michigan, um, people 
will identify with the shapes and the values and the color becomes expressive and it's uh it helps them to see what they don't that it helps them to see what they don't see on their own because they're so used to looking at the native color and the native visual that by changing colors up it makes it oftentimes more interesting i feel like i'm rambling so stop me please <laughs> uh, okay well and i've got several more questions for you and we're at 10 46 so if if you are willing steve and everybody else is willing i'm hoping that we can um take about 15 more minutes of your time oh yeah I, I, whatever i'm here forever so <laughs> oh, forever works we might take you up on that okay. i love to i love to talk about myself so let's talk about you what do you think about me so. we think you're fabulous so um wendy wants to know uh what your favorite subject is to paint well they break down into three different categories which uh, we kind of broke them down on our website. There's cityscapes, landscapes, and harbor waterscapes. waterscapes. Hardly ever do I do portrait work. I don't know. It just make. I just don't have an eye or a. Um, it's not in my DNA or my RNA. So portrait just don't do that. So I would have to say I find myself gravitating to cityscapes probably first, but but landscapes, and I paint, okay, I paint landscapes, but I try to paint my landscapes so that they, they have a feeling that the person's there. And so it's about, it's really, uh, it's really human centric. My subject matter will be human centric in one or two ways. It, it will either be an expression of an environment where the human form will be actually be or it will be expressed in a way a landscape so that it uh, becomes the point of view of a human i don't think this would express the point of view of a deer very well or a beaver or you know what i mean so so somewhere in my subject matter is the idea of uh the the human centric subject if you look at a lot of my sketchbooks, um, they're filled with examples that have um, more people. And so I guess I would have to lean more toward cityscapes uh, as a means of expression. I find myself um, in coffee shop, well, in days past, in coffee shops or restaurants or places, uh, bus stations. And usually I'm that guy that the police are keeping an eye on because um, I look strange and I'm doing strange things, but usually I'm just sketching. But then here, here are some landscapes in the same usually. sketchbook. What? Usually. <laughs> usually I'm just sketching, right. From Carolyn, are the iterative, I'm not sure I'm saying that right, iterative sketches all done specifically on watercolor paper? No. Um, most of the time, yes, but like this, these books are watercolor paper. That's, that's why I carry them. And if, if I'm talking to a student, right, and I'm encouraging them to work with these kinds of books, even though it's watercolor paper and it's perforated, I have them raise their hand and give me a promise that they won't, uh, they won't rip the page out, that they'll leave the good, the bad, and the ugly all in the same book because we're creating stories, many stories of, of our lives. These are capturing moments. They're, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Legacies. We're creating legacies um, when we do these books. Yeah, sure, they're, ex they're ways of exploring subject and, um, and capturing ideas quickly, but we're also creating a legacy of where we were in, in this particular case, where were we were in uh, March of 2020. And, what kinds of things were we thinking about and developing and now i'm going to answer the question i'm going to land the airplane but um so i i quite often paint on a watercolor paper i sketch on watercolor sketchbooks sometimes i will use a multi a mul this is a um, mixed media paper if i like if i'm developing 
uh, sketch ideas and I want to be fast about it. This whole thing was done on multi and I want to be fast about it. And I know I'm going this, I'm going here. Um, I will use that kind of paper, but at some point I'll transition over to a, an Arsh's watercolor paper. Um, I buy them in sheets. I buy 140 rough and I will tear up a 140 rough to quarter sheets and eighth sheets and keep stacks of like nine by 12s or 15 by whatever the dimension would be, 15 by 22 or whatever in the studio so that I can just grab it, tape it down and work on watercolor paper. Because it does, it does have a different, uh, it does react differently. But for developing ideas, um, I like I like both of these. I really love these books. But if anybody is going to take my recommendation and go out and buy um, these paper, th this uh, these sketchbooks, they have to promise me psychically right now that when they buy them, they will not rip out any of the pages because that would be sacrilege. I mean, it just anyway. Okay, so I'm getting uh, more questions here, and so we've got about eight minutes left. Um, back to the magic tape. Do you prefer yeah. multiple pages in your sketchbook ahead of going out into the field? No, I don't because I, um, if this gets in the sun, it will, um, it will defeat the, per it'll start melting it. So you want it to be down, you don't want it to be on the paper any longer than it has to be. And it just takes a quick second, you know, if you have a knife, it just takes a quick second to to put it down and then you know you can be working on it blah 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 right so it really is is pretty painless i carry these rolls of tape in my my pockets and you know anyway you know you can you can uh get it down really fast and then um when you're finished and you have to be very careful with this too, that you don't pull it up too soon, because if the paper is wet, it you know it'll start tearing the, the grain of the paper also. So I don't know if I can get this up um, without. Now I couldn't do this with the art, whatever that art teaser. It would have torn the, the tooth of the paper because it was wet. When I'm out painting and sketching. Um, you know the wind and the sun it it just dries things so quick that you don't want the tape to be down any more than it really needs to be i hope that answers that question it does thank you now jane would like to know um, a little bit more about your painting on canvas and yeah. sealing it with a uv protective lacquer can you right. compare that um to painting on watercolor paper yeah just started doing this like I've uh, been doing it a year and I will buy pre um, gessoed bo boards and I'll buy uh, gallery wrap canvas, but it's uh, pre gessoed. Now the gesso I, f I find to be very interesting. Um, for, why do I do it? Because I like the texture. I like that, uh, that clothy texture that comes through the, the reads through the painting uh, and watercolor is really good for that because it's so thin as it goes down, it will really um, highlight that texture. But the way watercolor reacts on top of the gesso canvas is a lot like working on Yupo, you know, where it sits up on top of the surface for a long period of time. Um, and it does, and it will eventually seep down into the gesso, but but it will sit up there for a long time. So lifting out, scratching in, uh, mixing colors on top, it really accentuates the wet in wet technique. Now some some things about that is it will dry unevenly. In other words, if if I was if this was on canvas board, this area right here where I've got washes on top of washes, or I'm working wet and wet, but I've got a higher uh, concentration of gray here than I have here. I know this because it's spattered. Um, again, in workshops and classes, we talk about this is a technique, and I could uh, 
spend more time ex explaining it and I'd love to do it. But um, on canvas, you'll get these separations of darkness because of the way that the color is pooling on the canvas. And so you'll get these really variegated areas within the wash that um, it creates a really dynamic working environment. And you can, and you know, you're trying to create the side of a building. So you want it to have one value and, and have one surface quality, but uh, the way the watercolor will go down on that, and I paint flat too, by the way, um, the way the watercolor goes down, it will invariably create a variegated presentation of, of color. But I can wash it out, I can lift it out, I can spray it, um, I can go over it with another color, I can do layering of colors. That's how I create the painting. Then once I've got the painting and it dries, it has to be bone dry, um, like I'll leave it set for a day or two. Then I go over it with an archival, I can't I don't remember, I think it might be Krylon, it might be uh, a different manufacturer, but it's an archival UV protecting spray. And um, sometimes I just spray it like seven, seven coats of that, of that UV lacquer. I think it'd be lacquer, yeah. And then, or I'll use uh, an acrylic lacquer, I'll spray it with the archival spray first so it creates a, a, a barrier and then I can uh, rub on top or layer uh, on top a, um, a gel medium. Um, I'm thinking of, uh, what do I have downstairs right now? I have golden and um, I can, it's, a, it's a red bottle but it looks milky white and it dries crystal clear and it's got UV, I can't remember what it's called but so I'll put that on um, with a credit card. I'll swipe it on later and it puts a real heavy coat of non-yellowing, non-fading UV protection over the top of it. And it presents, and it's usually matte. I use a matte as opposed to a gloss varnish. And um, some people use gloss, but I, I think matte, it, when it hangs in a room, it picks up less uh, ambient light and reflections on the wall if it's matte. So, and then I will finish those canvas pieces that way. So what I may do, Steve, is get the name of that product after we're done with the interview and then I can just include it in the video. Sure, yeah. Perfect, okay. From Jack, do you ever pencil sketch on painting first or do you always go directly to painting? And does this help with your expressive style? Great question. Boy, that is a great question. The answer is 99% of the time I am, um, I am painting without any guidelines whatsoever. However, I will work in, if I'm, if I'm uh, trying to work on some design ideas, I, I will work with a uh, pencil sketch. Uh, here, here, this is um, a la Frank Webb or, or Tinda Das. Um, their their style or their their process of thinking um, is what was behind this. I was really looking at a lot of Frank Webb work, and and I will work with pencil if I do. I also carry um, I don't see it. I'll, I'll carry fountain pens with me. Oh, right here. I carry fountain pens with me because I can take my brush and I can wet the brush in and I can do a uh, an ink, if you will, an ink wash drawing uh, fairly quickly, besides the fact that I just absolutely love fond pens. But generally speaking, no, uh, it's 99% of the time it's, it's this. And it is because I like to think and draw with my brushes. So I will carry lots of different, um, different kinds of brushes. I have, uh, I have uh, dagger brushes, I have um, different size brushes with me, and if I need to get more calligraphic, I can. I have the ability to do that. I also carry big wash brushes. Uh, I like Escoda, but I really love Princeton brushes. I carry these uh, quill brushes with me, wash brushes. I like, uh, uh, this is a Jackson Kalinske brush out of J Jackson, and then I also carry Da Vinci, I have a whole 
line of uh, Da Vinci Casio Neo brushes. Again, they're all uh, synthetic brushes, but when I wet them up, I can get a very expressive brush stroke with it. And I, and I have, I, at about five years ago, maybe a little longer than that, I'm losing track of time as I get balder and older, I made the decision to just sketch and paint with my brush and try to learn how to work with value and uh, brush stroke and cal the calligraphy of watercolor right out of the gate without that process. Now, now that's my preference that, you know, all the other guys, uh, men and women that are out there that I see demonstrating all over the place, you know, they'll do pencil underlay drawings. And I think that's fine too. I just don't do that. I do think that it does help me get it, it forces me to be more correct with my shapes or, or to not care about it, you know, to be more expressive with my shapes. So it's a personal decision, but I, I think it probably does have a lot to do with the actual looseness of the material when I'm finished. Yeah. Great. Okay. So I have a couple or two last questions for you. And uh, one, You've mentioned some of this already, but what do you carry with you? I'd have to have like a huge backpack to be able to do what, what you do. So what do you yeah. carry with you when you go out? <laughs> okay. Everything you own. Sue, Sue, we should, why don't you bring that up? No. We'll, uh, <laughs> why don't you bring it up and we'll finish off. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to, uh, we're going to bring up the other, um, we're going to bring up the other computer here, but Sue is laughing. I don't know if you could hear her. So we need three camels and two pack mules <laughs> whenever I go, because it's always the whole, um, well, what if I need this? What if I'm not feeling that? What if I need these colors? Blah, blah, blah. But generally, um, if I go out, I will carry this kind of a pan. It's got, uh, I think these are full pans, and I've got 24, um, 24 choices in here. Um, I will use maybe four of the 24. And so, so that way, so I've also bought smaller ones and I'm trying to become a lot more uh, conservative in what I take in the field with me. So I'm forcing myself to carry small boxes with a tripod and they usually have a palette, uh, maybe 10 or 12 brushes. I have a whole, I have a whole pot, uh, thing of travel brushes. There must be 10 or 15. Um, but I'll pack this, but then I'll always pack 10 or 12 of the big ones too because I can't not. Um, and then I'll pack uh, 16 by 20 boards and pre pre um, rip paper, pre uh, precise paper. But the, the answer to your question is, he he takes a lot also. He okay. doesn't have okay. it narrowed no. down. No, that's true. Okay. So so if I'm going to Cherry Creek to paint, I my car will be just full of art supplies and I'll usually take uh, a tripod, a box, and a couple of brushes, and I've got um, um flasks that I carry water in, and that's what I actually walk the park with painting. But I've got it in, <laughs> I've got it in the car just in case. Well, what if I want lavender? <laughs> yeah. So, but I'm trying really hard to um, to get better about value, painting and value, and then a little bit of color. Great. Okay, so I know I I looked at your website. You also have a YouTube channel, mm -hmm. and it has um, a lot of information on there and shows you painting quite a bit. So people could go there and see some of your process as well. Oh yeah. Thanks for bringing Yeah, we're working on, um, right now Steve's teaching uh, classes, which he teaches through the Art Students League. Um, mm -hmm. And so he's teaching classes that way with Zoom. And then he also has private lessons, students that he's teaching privately on Zoom. And so uh, what, we're, what we're working toward is we'd like to do sort of a video series then that people could um, purchase or whatever. We haven't worked out all the details on that, but for right now, I do try to put things up pretty fairly regularly, not as regularly as I would like to be honest, but it does show his process. 
Right. And um, then we have videos that we do that aren't, uh, we don't have public on the YouTube channel, but when people take classes, then we forward those to people so that they can watch and practice along and, and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, we do try to keep things just so people can kind of see how he paints um, on the YouTube channel. So that's kind of fun to go watch. It is fun. I enjoyed it. I know. I, I think you mentioned it before. You're so you're on most of the social media channels, right? Yeah. So we have a we have a Facebook page, and then Steve has a personal Facebook page, but it's still pretty much art related. And then we have a Facebook watercolor art of Steve Griggs page, um, and of course our website. There's lots of information. That was one of the things they said on the RT Shark uh, video that they did was it's very robust. I have a lot of stuff on the on the website. Um, you can find us on Pinterest. I don't do a lot with Pinterest. Um, you can find us on Instagram and um, Facebook, like I said, LinkedIn, anything else. I think that's pretty much it. it. Um, but, you know, all of the major sort of social media platforms, you can find us. Yeah. Great. So what I'll do is I'll list all of those in the video so that all of you can find them. And um, any last words of wisdom for us? While you're thinking of words of wisdom, can I interject one other thing? Of course. Okay, thank you. Um, if you wouldn't mind, just make sure everybody has access to um, the email address too, because if anybody is interested in classes or whatever, uh, they can contact us that way. And we have several articles that we've written, um, either that were written about Steve or that we've written uh, in collaboration with one another. And those are all on our website too. And you can access either the online version of the article or the actual PDF of the magazine article under the uh, tab that says press on our website. So there are different ones. Uh, there's some, uh, one article in particular that's about Stephen Histel, but there are process uh, articles as well on different things like color and people and different things like that. So I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that those were there and they do give technique. Uh, words of wisdom. The things <laughs> that I always tell my students, because they come into the class um, wanting to paint like me, and a lot of them are just wonderful artists, right? They're in their own right. They are, they're just wonderful artists. They want to paint like me. I'm the only one who can paint like me. And that's true of you too. Paint what you paint, paint how you paint, draw how you paint, because we are all here, we all have something to say, and we all need each other to say what we have to say and enjoy that in, in, in each other. We live in a world that is, seems to be pressing us in more and more to be more science, technology, engineering, and math oriented in our thinking and living. And don't get me wrong, I love that, I especially love the way we're developing things in the midst of this crisis, you know, the, the, the way technology is coming up and rising up to help limit human suffering, that is necessary. But the human story is one that is told from the heart of an artist. It, that's why we have poetry and music and art. If visitors were to come from another universe, I, I don't think that they would come into our atmosphere and say, hey, bring me all your best scientists and your best politicians and your best, best business people. I think what they would say is, bring me your best artists and let me talk to them because I wanna find out why we should keep you around. We obviously have the technology to, to not have you around, but why should your story continue? And I think it is the artist that tells the story. And I tell it my way and you tell it your way. And that's what I try to tell the students. And a lot of them say, well, I wanna paint like you. And I say, yeah, copy, 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 copy. But at some point, learn your own voice. And your voice is beautiful and, and is more, as important as any other voice. That's what I would say is what we're about as a business. That's what we're about as, uh, that's what I'm about in the classroom when I, when I try to uh, bring watercolor to people. It's not just about learning watercolor, it's about learning how to be a human being and more of a, um, a sweeter spirit and a sweeter heart. The hand and, and mind stuff is all technique and you can learn that, but learning heart and soul, kindness, uh, it's all part of an artist's vision and an artist's contribution to 
our, to humanity, be that. That's, that's what I would say. And th thank you so much for inviting us. I hope that, I hope we don't have people that are going to be asleep and, and have, <laughs> have the uh, Zoom meeting continue. <laughs> but um, that's what we're about. That's what we are going to spend the remainder of our days is to anybody who will listen. Sometimes it's just the cat and the dog. But um, that's what we're about. So thank you for inviting us. It was great to be here. Oh, thank you so much. We've loved every minute of it. And the fact that you're willing to spend your time with us means a lot to all of us. So uh, from Diane, just wonderful. Thank you. And I, I know we'll be in touch. I will do my best to get this video up by sometime tomorrow and I'll let you know when that's done. Oh, we've got applause <laughs> and I'll applaud too. <laughs> Um, but it's been a real pleasure for me uh, getting to know you. I've admired you from afar and all of your fabulous work. And, and so now I feel like I, I know you both a bit better and I'm thrilled by that. Uh, from Wendy, he says, thank you. <laughs> um, so I'll call this meeting to a close as much as I don't want to close us off, but it's been a pleasure and I'll definitely be in touch and looking for those private lessons. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.